Hi, everyone. So yes, as it's been said awkwardly before, it's me between you and your lunch. But uh, I'll keep it short, one hour as expected. No, nobody's shouting behind. So, and it does work. So I'll start by introducing myself, Fabien Benetou. What do I do? Uh, so I'll start by introducing a little bit that I'm not an official for the European Parliament. So I give my perspective, which is different from giving the official position of the European Parliament. So what I see is my opinion. It does reflect what's actually happening, but don't quote me as the European Parliament, please. Uh, and there is a little disclaimer to put this in. Um, so, what do I do? A little bit of my background. Uh, you might know Lynn Segers from uh, LucidWeb. So a couple of years ago, uh, we so she started a startup that I helped build in terms uh, of CTO, uh, and that was very exciting. Um, that um, was a very exciting project, and with a different perspective. That it was focusing on video streaming, video on 360. Um, product. So that was extremely good. I learned quite a bit, um, but then I had to move on. The project is still going on, so I invite you to check. I think she's um, at AWE, so you can meet her there. And I also help startups uh, to develop their product. So I do understand the startup mindset, uh, and I'll explain a bit more why I'm here. Which is, so does anybody know? This is in Germany. Does anybody know where this is, or what this event is? So that's the Chaos Communication Congress. So that's not, it's a little bit different from institution. Uh, it's a hacker congress. Uh, it's, it's a crazy place, but in the good sense of crazy. Uh, because it's question, questioning what is technology, what it's good for, what are technology that are a little bit strange, let's say, or what is the impact of technology. Um, and I really like it because it does challenge quite some assumptions, especially in terms of communication and marketing. You see amazing slide, amazing presentation, but you don't necessarily know how it's working, um, how the sausage is made, uh, to say it a bit bluntly. And it's questioning all this, what is actually being promoted, said, and what's actually done, and how it's done. So I find this an extremely, um, it's a mind-blowing experience, really. Um, and it does question what makes the technology good, in terms of how it's done, but in terms of usages also, because you can have something that is, I'm, I'm a technology enthusiast, I'm a developer, uh, so I really love playing with technology. The problem is sometimes exciting technology can be put to, I mean, you saw the keynote at the very beginning when you had a certain mark photo right there. Um, that can be in terms of business model, it is successful. Selling data from users is a successful business model. What does it lead to? What is the influence it's played with? It's a little bit different. So when I was at this event, as I said, my blowing event, I really invite you to get there. But I thought, well, I can help my friends. I'm a developer. I can tell them, you can install a VPN. You can use this operating system. Uh, they can tell the family, so that can help them to do, I believe, at least to my technical level of knowledge, what is the right thing, uh, based on their moral or ethical compass. But that's a very small circle. That's just me, friends, the family. Um, so if I want technology to be done right, used in the right way, I'll use a taboo word in terms of technology, but I think regulation matters. I think regulation is interesting. I think, like I said, I love to play with technology, but it has to be done right and for the right usage. So that's why uh, I started to work at the European Parliament. Because the European Parliament, like other EU institutions, is giving a framework. It's playing with technology to say, or actually learning about technologies um, to understand how it's working, when it's being used correctly, when it's not. So I, that's, that's the whole reason I'm there. Um, so I, like I said, I work at the European Parliament, but there is also the Court of Justice. There is also um, the European Commission and the Joint Research Center. So for the Court of Justice, it's very new to start to have an innovation department. Uh, for the Commission, well, of course, you have uh, Innovation 2020, so programs to manage innovation from startups and companies and research center, and the GRC. So this is based in ISPRA. I don't know if you know about it, but it's basically studying what, what is the state of the art of technology and science, foundational basic science. And that's what can be funded, what is a long-term strategy goal for the European Union. So I'll focus a bit more on the European Parliament. I'm sure you all know everything about it, but just a little remember, in terms of scale, we have 700, more or less, MEPs, members of the European Parliament. Uh, and 
this is, let's say, the visible tip of the iceberg. You have one president and 12 vice presidents. Um, and behind all this is a lot of staff. So to give an order of magnitude, uh, the building is hmm, maybe, I don't know, let's say two or three times uh, this whole MOC, the whole mess. So it is huge uh, in terms of space. And it's also really distributed all around Brussels, but also Strasbourg. Uh, and also Luxembourg. So in terms of staff and space, it is quite big. Um, and I'll give you a little bit rundown, but we have, of course, the, the European Parliament itself, the Secretariat, the Directory General for uh, DGI Tech for every um, information services, so managing database, planning servers, these kind of things. Within it, uh, innovation and resources, performance, and in my opinion, a little bit biased opinion, the most exciting service, the innovation service. Um, that's us. So it's a small team. It's a little bit less, like uh, we were 10,000 in the parliament. We are a bit less than 10, me and my wonderful colleagues. Uh, and we have a process. We have a theoretical process. So I just, for example, write articles about VR, AR, uh, whatever is related to uh, emerging technologies that are focusing on spatial computing, which is not my favorite part, I have to admit. Writing documents is, I mean, I have to do it at some point. Uh, we have a platform called the Innovate Platform, internal to the parliament, where basically you work at the parliament and you get frustrated because the workflow is not that efficient, uh, because you're missing some tools, because you think you have any ideas on how to improve it, so you can just either voice you need or say, well, I've seen this latest super cool gadget. Is it actually working that well? Uh, can we implement it in the workflow? Uh, and then if you do, if we, for example, try this workflow and it is more efficient, then uh, you'll be the leading innovator in your service and say, well, we don't just implement it. We see over the long term uh, how it's working. So within your team, uh, you will help to introduce this to a broad scale. Um, to be a little bit more practical, uh, the process of UC is a little bit abstract, and I can clarify it after um, during the day, but um, we'll have case studies. So case studies are a bunch of proof of concept and demonstration. Uh, so for example, we worked with Mimesis. Uh, we have a little, I'll be honest there also, we have a little European bias in terms of technology and implementation. Um, first, because it's the European Parliament, but also because of GDPR, as we mentioned also during the keynote, we want to know where is our data, how it's being used, in which processes, just saying, oh, your data is safe, it's not good anymore. We don't necessarily need on-premise, um, but we need to know what's happening with the data. When it's proof of concept, we don't care, but if we do scale up to actually implement it in the parliament, you need to tell us everything you're doing with our data, which I believe makes sense. Uh, so we started with, to work with Mimesis. Um, so it's a former European startup, because you might have heard they got bought by Magic Leap two months ago, something like this, um, on a collaboration in AR. But initially, they were doing also development for uh, virtual reality and how to do sketching notes, um, organizing information spatially. So that was quite interesting proof of concept. We didn't go further than this. Um, as you can see, we have several types of projects. Push projects are uh, where somebody, when somebody in our team uh, will say, that's a cool technology. Is it useful for you? Uh, you never, you didn't even know it existed, but we think maybe there is a fit. So we are going to push it a little bit on you and you're going to tell us, no, that it doesn't make any sense or yes, we like it. And internal tooling is, this is not for the public at large. This is going to impact just the European Parliament, uh, which was, that was an interesting project, but we didn't go further. Um, Another internal communication, we have a library, a physical library. It's an amazing building uh, full of knowledge and skilled people, but people just stay behind the laptop, just searching on our internet, which is good, but it's maybe not good enough. Uh, so we wanted to invite people in the library without having to actually pull there by the hand physically. So uh, we did a web VR um, presentation of the library, so you can just browse on your phone or on your laptop, or on your desktop in the parliament, and discover what is the library about, what are the different rooms, just to get a sense of the physical building and people inside it. So you could navigate inside it, and of course, because it's web VR, you could put a headset or a cardboard, whatever you had. I even have a, a little, if we have time for questions, I'll have goodies. 
which is that we have our little uh, European Parliament made uh, little headset, the smallest possible, like the Homido Mini. I don't know if you've seen that before. Just the smallest one. So, so nice for a demo. You can just put it in your pocket. I'll just, I see some people who haven't seen this before. So, up. Just open it up, fly it on your phone. And voila, you have a VR headset. OK, it's not a Valve Index. It's not a Varjo. It's not high-end VR. But to give a first taste, and you put it back. Up. So neat. So for demonstration, uh, when we do events, everything, we have those little uh, tools. Uh, and as I say, internal communication, people can feel inside the library without having been there before. Um, an equivalent, that's why I put it right after, um, which, which was asked for a quester, so a dedicated member of, uh, of the European Parliament who is focusing on art. Basically, we have an amazing collection inside the European Parliament. The problem is you need a badge of the European Parliament to get in, so it's a little bit limiting. So we thought, or she suggested directly, rather, uh, that we would bring the collection outside. So we made, again, a little visit in VR using 360 camera, taking photos here and there, doing a path of what is, for us, the most exciting art on display. And you can say where it's using low-end VR or entry, let's say, level VR and uh, high-end headset, or just on your laptop again to get an easier transition to it. Um, we also, so like I said, you can imagine the mess, uh, the building, you multiply it by three times. Uh, the first time <laughs> when I started uh, in the parliament, um, of course, I wanted to uh, work hard and I spent the whole day there and it was like, I don't know, let's say 6.30 p.m., not, not 11 p.m. Uh, and I, my colleagues were gone, and, and I was like, I don't know how to get out. I actually don't know. It's like three elevators, and you go through this building, that building, you have a change of level between two buildings that are next to each other. So I was a little bit afraid that I would have to sleep actually under my desk. Uh, luckily, after a little bit of searching, I find my way. Um, but indoor uh, geolocation and wayfinding makes so much sense when you have such a big building. And also because people in the building, let's say MEPs, have an agenda that just by looking at their agenda, you get a headache. It's 15 minute slots, and on one slot, they are in four different places at once. So you can imagine that their schedule is packed, so you have to go efficient when you go from point A to point B. So indoor geolocation made a lot of sense. We did a quick proof of concept four years ago, um, which worked relatively well, but on a very small uh, space. Um, so that was, let's say, 100 square meters, more or less. Uh, great proof of demo, made a lot of sense, was exciting, using ER to show the path. But um, just as an internal tool, it was exciting, but not more than this. Uh, so this year, we tried again, another proof of concept for indoor geolocation. Um, this was pool in the sense that we had some department that requested it, uh, not us just pushing for it. And using augmented reality, as you can see, you show the path from where you are to where you got to go. The different services, like maybe you need to book um, a room there, maybe you need to reach that other room, so a different services integrated to it. So the goal there, we think of the proof of concept, not just to get from A to B or to do the service, but also can we use it? as a platform? Can we use indoor geolocation to add services on top of it? Like I said, for example, booking a different room. Uh, so it helps us not just to do the proof of concept, but to imagine what are the next services coming in one, five, ten years. Uh, yeah, I'll just, can I go back? Yes. Uh, what was the little bit, hmm. What was a little bit tricky? So we're not rolling it out, unfortunately, for now. It's still on hold. Um, and I, I'll clarify that at the end also. But scaling is such a big issue. Uh, that's also why we do proof of concept, demonstration, the whole process. is because we're only playing with the emerging technologies. That's our role as the innovation service. We need things that might work, but maybe not. And if we don't know, because we read the brochure. When you read the brochure, it's always working perfectly everywhere. When you watch the video, it's always flawless. So we don't accept videos. We only accept the actual demonstration, a proof of concept. If you cannot send a link to something we can try, even though we're very optimistic, 
um, it's not going to work. We need to try the actual thing, get our hands on it. Uh, it doesn't mean, and we can sign NDA, um, it's not a problem. So we can really have early stage uh, tools, but we need the tool itself, not a video of it. Um, and that actually worked. We tried to do markerless, so you don't want like a QR code somewhere. Uh, but markerless, um, six months ago especially, did not scale to such um, vast building. Uh, and if it did, for example, then when you have, so let's say this room about three times in length, you go from A to B, that kind of works, but you get an offset, so your slight one degree difference compounds to 50 meters, 10 meters difference. And then you have to go up on some stairs that are one meter, two meters wide, so that just doesn't work. And, and the whole goal is to improve efficiency for persons with a 15 minutes agenda slot. So we had to give up on this. We even tried with markers. Uh, the problem then is in terms of design. It's a big, beautiful building. And because it's also involving politicians, it's a building that has to um, look good because there are a lot of cameras everywhere. Uh, so you, you cannot just put a huge black and white marker there. That just doesn't work. Um, so we're still exploring this. So again, this is, um, it's okay for a service that we fail because it means another service is not going to fail there. We want to fail as early as possible to say, well, the technology is nearly there, but not good enough for our needs. Uh, so this for now is still on hold. Um, we also do crazier things. Um, it's a huge, the, the amount of data we have to go through. Um, is significant, let's say. Um, and we're pretty, most of us are very good in terms of uh, seeing a, a data set displayed visually. Like we can get insights very efficiently through beautiful and interesting data visualization. Uh, so we explore data visualization for regulation. Uh, so this, for example, is the uh, Wikidata ontology of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is um, something that the European Parliament uh, is exploring directly, um, but it's a complex topic. So how can we navigate through the different fields, subfields, concept of AI? So we explore the ontology by going through the different fields in VR. Uh, just internal tooling, our suggestion, so push. Uh, we're just showing it to people who are working in the field to see does it actually give you insight or is it not? We also explored, um, so <laughs> This makes me laugh because um, I think of myself five or ten years ago, and regulation, as I also mentioned before, it wasn't taboo, but it, wasn't, it was like the most boring thing ever. I'm not an accountant, and I have to do a little bit of accounting here and there. I hate it. I don't find it exciting. Uh, and I thought regulation, documents about regulation, like give, give this to me when I go to sleep so I can snore and just forget about it. But now, as, as I mentioned, I do think it's one important, and two, um, it's a complex topic that if it is important, you need to simplify and help improve. So I'm actually getting excited by regulation. So my former self 10 years ago would just not believe this. But I think, it, and it is, um, the amount of data you have to go through is really significant because regulation goes through a complex process. So updates all the time, challenging from somebody from your party, another party, somebody who will say, well, this is not actually compatible with the regulation that was five years ago, 10 years ago, and other fields. So it, you have a lot of um, processes to go through. Uh, so we try to augment it. So you have, for example, here a document that has been detected, recognized, and then you highlight zones that are, might be interesting based on your own profile. For example, I'm not a lawyer. There are terms there about um, law. So we expand on it. We have extra information that's displayed on top of it. And it's using web XR, actually. There is a mistake on my slide. Um, so it means, again, I just take my phone, uh, view the document, no need to install anything. It's just straight from uh, the web. Um, and also we do really out there uh, proof of concept. So this is, again, also WebXR, not WebVR. But um, it's not even internal tooling. It's just exploration. So I'm using a magic leap. And then I'm using uh, blinking, so I'm just using my eyes to control documents. So I don't have any hands to control them. And I just blink like this. It's a little bit awkward. Uh, I wouldn't use it in a formal meeting. 
like this to move documents around. So there are things like this that are pure exploration. We don't know where it's leading. We don't know what we're going to do with it, but we have to see what is the state of technology. Is it actually, uh, this looks very silly, but also we care about um, accessibility. So actually for somebody who cannot move their hands, this might be a meaningful way to interact with documents. So we do also crazy proof of content that don't have necessarily at the very beginning um, some way to be used. Um, one of the latest one, and I'll be able to um, show you a little bit after. So uh, I don't know if I clarified this before, but um, tomorrow I'll uh, do the developer track chair. Uh, so the whole day I'll be in, I don't know which room it is, it's over there, more or less. Uh, so if you have any question, if you want to discuss more in depth about any topic on the process, on, on procurement, on the technology itself, especially WebXR, very happy to have a chat But then. So we had this, um, the View 6 Blade uh, glasses. Um, we had, um, I'll just put them on for this. Put them on. Ah, microphone guy is going to hate me for this. I'll just put them there. Uh, so you put on the glasses and you do facial recognition because I think most of us are pretty good with faces. What's difficult is like, what actually is the name of that person and then when did I actually see her last time? And then what did we discuss about? So we use facial recognition uh, on those glasses to see who is in front of us. And then display, um, once you have the name, you basically cross check between um, Outlook, for example, or whatever the data you have to say, well, our last meeting was one week ago and we discussed about regulation on facial recognition. Um, that was, and we had little cards like this, like a deck of cards with a different, um, vice presidents of the European Parliament uh, to recognize them, also staff. Uh, so I was there to show my face and then have the uh, president of the European Parliament there to try it on. Uh, so he looked at me, recognized my face. He now re remembers that I'm Fabien, pretty proud of this, uh, and actually did work on the spot. So that was great success. Um, so why did we do this actually? Why does the president of the European Parliament wear those kind of crazy glasses? Uh, because Again, we don't want um, members of the European Parliament to regulate based on a PowerPoint. That just doesn't make sense. You want to regulate on a technology once you've tried it, when you get your hands in it, when you actually play with it, and then you start also not just to get idea of regulation, but idea on how to use it internally, how to use it in the Parliament to improve your workflow. So that's the whole, basically, idea behind the innovation service is no presentation, no PowerPoint. So I don't like to do this. What I want is <laughs> for you to come after and try what we've done, uh, that you can see actually what's been built. Presentation, of course, is nice for a larger, a larger audience, but in practice, it doesn't cut it compared to actually having the experience yourself. Once you put the glasses on and you do a little bit of facial recognition, it's very simple, it takes, I think it took one or two minutes maximum. Again, busy agenda. Um, but then you start to think, you go home after, it's like, well, this, this was exciting, but a little bit strange. What if I go to the bathroom with it? What if I go to a meeting where I don't display that the glasses are recording, et cetera, et cetera. So the ideas you get after are a lot more pragmatic, a lot more tangible. So that's why we found it so much more exciting to have hands-on experiences. Um, one of the last proof of concept was using, again, in um, pool. Somebody at the Parliament asked us, well, that's great, you have VR and 360 video, so we basically have some meetings that we stream in 360. You don't necessarily have access to the building, you want to be inside the meeting still. We just stream, I think, it, if I remember correctly, on YouTube, one of the sessions, for example, a parliamentary session. So all in all, what are the lessons learned? Well, that hands-on demonstration work. Uh, that once you put the headset, once you play with the technology, you get an actually meaningful sense of how it's working. Um, that gradual, <laughs> that if you just have to wear the headset, it's a little bit crazy. But as you go on, as you wear once or twice different ones, then you start to see beyond the dorky glasses, uh, but rather the usage of it. The very first time, usually people will wear it, laugh, take a selfie, move on. But it's not going to be considered that anything but a gadget, a toy. But as you wear them more and more, as you see people more and more, then it becomes more natural, basically. 
Um, we have, as I mentioned, you imagine several buildings like this. We actually have architects inside the parliament. Uh, so this, I don't even have to tell you, but they get super excited by it. They start to use it. We have uh, BIM models so that they can display them, seize them, improve on them, do it collaboratively. Uh, so that's already in place. And we also have XR in team building. So we had, I um, forgot the name of the experience, but basically you were supposed to do, you have a sinking submarine, I think. And then uh, you and your team have to find a way out, find, of course, a very stressful environment, but you don't want to be inside for real, but in, in VR makes a lot of sense. And uh, that worked quite well. We had really positive feedback on it. Now, the tricky part uh, is that scaling is not straightforward. And, and when you have a proof of concept, a demo, you think, OK, the demo works. Let's implement it. Let's do it large scale. Well. <laughs> If it only was that simple. So that's also why usually, if you're interested to work with the parliament, um, I'll have my contact at the end. Yes, do send a demo, not a video. Send the, send the, I'll check the video too, but send the demo also, because that's not going to be good enough. But also, I was discussing with someone yesterday on bigger projects. Um, we need case studies. If you just tell us, yeah, 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 it's fine. We'd use it in a bigger building. Um, don't worry about it. I'm going to say, sure, that's cool. But I, I need a case study to say which building can we trade at large scale, because uh, the expectations are quite high in the um, size of the building. So I keep on mentioning building because it's spatial computing, but anything leading to uh, scalability in terms of uh, latency, all this. We want case studies to um, actually not re-implement everything ourselves. We can re-implement something at scale together, but then we need some way to share the risk, basically. Um, Another negative part, let's say, is that hands-on demonstration work. You just put the glasses and you know what face recognition is. You don't need to see a movie. Um, but also expectations are mostly clear because you've, you've experienced it. But again, if we go back to scaling, for example, for face recognition, is you expect to walk in a, in a room of stranger in the dark, like now, and that it will work flawlessly. Probably not. Or you expect it to recognize 8 billion faces. Maybe not. If you do, then show me. <laughs> I'm excited to see this. But uh, yes, it, it's, it gives a better uh, understanding than just a video or just a document, but it's still not good enough. Uh, that shared vocabulary is missing. People say VR instead of AR. AR instead of VR. They just see dorky glasses. Like, oh, yeah, that's AR. Well, no, it's not. It's VR. So that also, just like gradual acceptance, takes a bit of time. You need to build a vocabulary. You need to be pedagogical about it. But demos also help. Again, they have some ground truth. Like now, I wore on the glasses. I know what's AR. I know what's facial recognition. Uh, and then that Passover remains a challenge. So we have our innovation service. Uh, we're a bunch of skilled people that work on those. But then when we have to say, well, OK, you want to implement this, for example, facial recognition at scale for security, uh, this is how it's working. Good luck. We can't say this. But also, we can't implement the project for the security service inside the parliament, because otherwise, if there is a new technology coming forward, we need to know about it. So that's our own difficulty there. Um, Long-term thinking, it's very theoretical. But basically, we start to have a strategy that we develop with one, five, 10 years. I'm not going to give it long, because like I said, very theoretical. Uh, I'm very excited that we showed it today, not two weeks ago, this presentation, because, um, like I said, we need to diffuse and be pedagogical about what is an emerging technology, VR and AR, for me in particular. So we basically show it to the European Parliament. We have a booth, um, just like here at the exhibition stand, and we show whatever we're building. And people were quite excited by it. Um, including, again, the president. Uh, that was the highlight of our week. Um, and it, it was so valuable because they usually don't have the, at least they say they don't have the time to come. So for them to come to the booth, try all those presentation, present, uh, proof of concept demonstration was really, really exciting. And for them too. Um, now, last slide on how you can help. So you can come say hi. Like I said, tomorrow on the whole uh, track room for the um, um, chair for the track room. My email is there, so it's fabian.benetou, my name, at x.europol.europa.eu. So yeah, share whatever you're building. Um, I was having discussion earlier during breakfast with uh, someone here. I'm 
hard to impress in the sense that I come here and I'll visit the booth and the exhibition. So if you don't have something that's actually new, it's going to be difficult. Like it's the innovation service. We're looking for novelty, new things, eventually how to use it. So, but do come say hi. Um, and of course, <laughs> the most exciting part, regulation. Uh, this is how to get procurement. If you want to actually work with the European Parliament, there is a bunch of rules. You will going to have to go through hoops. You cannot just say, hey, I know Fabien, I saw him at AWE, he's nice, we work together. No, we'll have um, a whole list of specifications. So we can discuss about those more annoying details after, but please get in touch. Thank you. <laughs>